Good morning. Um, Will and I are going to be talking about two types of claim, uh, known receipt and dishonest assistance. Just in terms of format, I'm the warm-up act. I'm going to be talking about knowing receipt, and then the main event will we'll be talking about dishonest assistance. We will aspire to speak for about 20 minutes each. We'll have a Q&A at the end. If anyone has any questions that are easy and make us look clever, then please fire away right away. You have a handout, which is designed to be packed with goodies. So speaking for myself, at least, I'll be taking a fairly light touch when it comes to the content. So here is on the slide a compare and contrast between the claims for knowing receipt and for dishonest assistance. So just a few points by way of embellishment. Firstly, if you're very quiet, you can hear Roger Stewart Casey talking about why the Court of Appeal possibly didn't get it right in Thornhill and why duties should be owed to third parties. Now, the interesting feature of both these accessory liability claims is that they can be brought by non-clients. Indeed, remarkably, for knowing receipt of these, they can be brought by opposite parties to the professional clients um, in, in litigation against the, the professional's client. So very much different from the position in the tort of negligence. And that means that these claims often give rise to privilege issues because you, the professional is not being sued by a former client. Um, the next point is in terms of PI insurance, it's obvious that claims for dishonest assistance will be covered There'll be fraud exception issues, but for most modern professional claims, that won't, of course, give rise to an issue. For knowing receipt, as I'll come on to explain, largely, perhaps exclusively almost, that will concern fees claims. And so that old chestnut arises. Are they therefore not covered by professional indemnity insurance? Now, some might say that given the decision now in Tugans, that that old chestnut depending on your point of view, has either been consumed or incinerated in the fire. Um, the next point, in terms of contribution claims, again, it's orthodox that claims for dishonest assistance are qualifying claims under the Act of 1978. Perhaps slightly less clear is the position with known receipt, but there's a case called City Index and Gora, which fairly strongly suggests that they can be capable of forming claims to contribution. So potentially, if you're acting for a defendant, you might be able to bring in other professionals on the basis either of dishonest assistance claims or known receipt claims. Uh, and then finally, just out of my own interest, as a straw poll, how many of you have met known receipt claims in the professional context? Yes, in, in my experience, they are relatively rare. They do give rise to regulatory issues, so it's possible that you've been asked to advise before litigation has blossomed, but when the professional is under some difficulty, for example, as to some money that they've received. So that's the introduction. Then the core elements of knowing receipt, they're set out for you on the slide. So beneficial receipt of property or its traceable substitute by the defendant where the claimant has a subsisting equitable interest in the property, where D's receipt arises from a breach of fiduciary duty or trust by TP, that's third party, not Tom Pangborn, uh, and fourthly and finally, where D had unconscionable knowledge that the received property is traceable to the breach by the third party. So just talking around that, from this point onwards, I'm not going to talk about property, because it seems to me that we'll always be talking about money. So I'll simply talk about money instead. Now, just to try to bring this claim to life in the factual situation as we would almost always see it, this claim arises now we see um, most commonly in corporate defalcations. So what we have is a claimant company, and there has been a rogue director who has siphoned off monies from that company. Uh, and the director is treated as being a trustee, and so that director will have broken trusteeship duties owed to the company. So we can all see that we have the beginnings of a knowing receipt play. So where does the professional fit in? Well, the answer is if they then beneficially receive 
the money's siphoned off by the director, then that may be qualifying receipt, such as to give rise to a known receipt claim. And then the next question, when might that happen? Well, really the only answer I can give you is that when they receive monies for their fees. So if, for example, the director has bought an extravagant property, then a valuer who's valued that property might be receiving siphoned off monies for the purposes of paying their fees. But my focus is on the following, which is a litigation solicitor in this situation. So the company is suing the rogue director. The rogue director instructs a litigation solicitor to defend the claim. And then the solicitor is receiving monies for its fees from a pond of monies that potentially has been siphoned off from the company. So that's how it arises most commonly. And as I go on and talk about other elements of this claim, I'm going to come back to that factual situation. So, unlike dishonest assistance, there are two species of knowing receipt claim, personal and proprietary. The personal claim, as the arrows are intended to uh, describe, the money has come in to the professional and it's gone. Now in that situation, the claimant bears the burden of proving all the elements of the known receipt claim. And as I'll touch on at the end, in terms of remedies, the remedy will be one for compensation because the actual monies or their traceable substitutes have gone. <coughs> now by contrast, the proprietary claim is where the monies are still with the defendant professional. And there, for one element of the claim, that is to say, the question of knowledge, the burden reverses. So it becomes the burden of the professional, as it were, to disprove naughty knowledge. And in that situation, the remedy is restitution in specie. I mean, in a sense, it doesn't matter for money, but theoretically, that's what the remedy is. Now, if we tie this in with our litigation solicitor, so defence costs are being paid. They are paid into, let's say, the client account, and then they are moved into the office account for the purposes of the payment of the fees. Now, whether there's a personal or proprietary claim will depend on the following. That if following the application, let's say the fees are a million pounds, let's say that the office account of the firm after the receipt goes down to zero, then by usual tracing principles, that means that there's no longer a traceable substitute of the money. So effectively, the money is gone. And that means that the claimant will only have a personal claim. But if, as will be the case certainly with many big firms, the office account is kept at a minimum level, and let's say that that minimum is one and a half million pounds, then the equitable rules of tracing will deem one million of that million and a half to be the claimant's money. And so in that situation, there will be a proprietary claim. So one of the interesting questions will be, from the time of receipt to the time that the third party claim is made, the question will arise, has there been a minimum balance in that office account, no less than the fees that are the subject of the claim. Uh, and principally, the significance of that will be the reversal of the burden of proof when it comes to the defendant's solicitor's knowledge. So core element one, beneficial receipt. And this is, to my mind, the principal reason why there are so few known receipt claims against professionals, because the receipt has to be for the benefit of the professional rather than the professional acting in an agency capacity. And of course, 99 times out of 100, the professional's receiving the money as an agent. And that's why, in many ways, Will is the one you want to listen to because it's in that situation that the claim is one for dishonest assistance rather than knowing receipt. And if we just, again, go back to our litigation solicitor, you get some very interesting issues arising because the invoice, 
that will have been sent to the client will of course concern profit costs, but it will concern disbursements too. Now there'll be internal disbursements, photocopying and things like that, but external disbursements as well, such as council's fees. And interesting questions arise whether that element of the money that is received is received ministerially or not. Uh, and I had a matter that concerned the combar terms and payment basis B. And in the, on that basis, the solicitor is a collection agent for the barrister. And very interesting questions arise whether therefore that sum of money is received ministerially or not. So that's core element number one. Core element number two is that the claimant has to have a subsisting equitable interest. <coughs> so that's the first limb of that. And the other side of the coin is that the receipt by the defendant is a result of, let's say, the rogue director's breach of trust. Now, we're in a very interesting situation where we've had recently a Supreme Court case, Byers and Saudi National Bank, where questions of knowing receipt were argued with enormous skill and at enormous length. But in many ways, the answer that's been given will not impact our day-to-day -day analysis of the knowing receipt play. But the question that was put was as follows, that if there is a situation where upon receipt of the money by the defendant, the equitable interest of the claimant has been extinguished, does that therefore mean that you cannot have a claim for knowing receipt. Now the appellant argued that the theoretical basis of the knowing receipt claim should be the fault of the defendant. That should be the only qualifying element. So effectively, in our case, if the litigation solicitor has the necessary knowledge, that's enough. It happened. The Supreme Court rejected that and took the view that the key requisite is that there is a subsisting equitable interest. So effectively, the remedy that the court grants is a response to identifying a subsisting equitable interest on the part of the claimant. So, it is not fault-based, it is an answer to an equitable interest. So if we consider again our litigation solicitor, what matters is when the money is received by the solicitor, does the claimant company still have a subsisting equitable interest? Now, most of the time, the answer to that will be yes. But one of the, because certainly the receipt by the solicitor, assuming that the solicitor has the requisite knowledge, will not cause the equitable interest to be extinguished. So that's not a problem. But what may happen, and what we need to look out for, is that the money may have been on a journey between the claimant company and the defendant solicitor. And that journey may arguably have involved the extinguishment of the equitable interest. So one of the things that commonly happens is the director tries to hide the money by creating false commission payments. And in theory, they are a product of a contractual arrangement which will have extinguished the equitable interest. So that is something that we need to consider. So that allows us to set up a decision tree, which you can see on the slide. So when the defendant receives the money, is, is it equity's darling? I've always wanted to say that phrase. <laughs> so that is to say, is it bona fide? Well, let's put that to one side. Is it a purchaser for value without notice? Now, we tend to use notice, but here we can also say without knowledge. If the answer to that is yes, so if the professional firm is equities darling, then that's the end of that. There cannot be a knowing receipt claim, because being equities darling means that the claimant's prior equitable interest has been extinguished. And importantly, and as buyers emphasised, if that is the case, then even if, whilst the professional still has the money, the professional comes to learn 
for the first time that the money is the product of breaches of fiduciary duty by the director. That does not resurrect the claim. So it's a binary moment, and if it's extinguished, then that's the end of that. If the defendant is not equity starving, then in a sense we have to allow the clock to continue to run. And we ask the question that at the point that the defendant effectively converts the money to their own use, does the claimant's interest, equitable interest, persist? If no, then no knowing receipt can they court claim to be brought. If yes, then it can. And then the final aspect to it, as I've discussed earlier, is if it so happens that the defendant still has the money or its traceable proceeds, then the claimant can have a proprietary claim in respect of those monies. So for our litigation solicitor, in fact, this becomes a relatively straightforward analysis. So that solicitor will always be a purchaser for value because they would have provided professional services. <coughs> and so it comes down to the question of knowledge or notice. So at the moment of receipt, if there is no knowledge, then there is no claim. And as I've said, even if knowledge is subsequently acquired, that's irrelevant. If on the other hand there is knowledge, then there will be a claim. And under English law, I can't really conceive of a situation where following receipt, the claimant's equitable interest would be extinguished. Bias was a question of Saudi law, and there are only very, very few exceptions under English law where an equitable interest can be overridden. Now, just finally on this topic, what this does mean, because the claimant bears the burden, both in personal claims and proprietary claims, in establishing their equitable interest, and that the monies that derive from breaches by, let's say, the rogue director. It gives rise to very interesting questions of proof, because what will often have happened is there will already have been litigation between the claimant company and the director, and there will probably have been a plethora of judgments that concern the situation between the claimant company and the director. And so the interesting question for the professional is to what extent do those judgments bind the professional when it comes to the knowing receipt claim? If they do, then the claimant will have established the equitable interest and that it derives from defalcations by the director. If they don't, then potentially that is a very difficult thing for the claimant to prove. So that's something that we need to be alive to. So knowledge. Now, probably the first thing to say, the slide, if you read it, looks quite decisive. But in truth, the issue of knowledge is a mess. Um, and Byers, as I say again, was a peculiar case because the questions were so finely argued. But questions of knowledge were, naturally, were actually not in point. And so the Supreme Court effectively could not rule upon them. But it seems to me reasonably clear that if ever questions of knowledge go back to the Supreme Court, they're going to shake it up quite dramatically. But nonetheless, I'm going to seek to articulate what the position is now. So in terms of timing, well, we've seen that already. It's date of receipt as to equities, darling, or otherwise we allow the clock to run. Now, the basic test is one of unconscionability. And the problem with that is, in a sense, at least we know what the test is, it's unconscionability. But what unconscionability amounts to in any particular case is not easy to determine. And what has happened is that, so unconscionability test was laid down by the Court of Appeal in a case called Ingrid Montague Settle, which I think was something like 1987. Before then, the courts had tried to apply the Baden Delvo five-fold classification that we probably all met in one guise or another. So three species of actual knowledge, two species of constructive knowledge. So you then had this decision of the Court of Appeal, no, 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 it's unconscionability. But then the Court's thinking, well, what does unconscionability mean? And there's been a drift back towards the Barden-Delvaux classification. And there are a number of first instance decisions 
where you can see the judges applying that five-fold classification. So honouring that, I've broken it down into actual knowledge, as you can see, and constructive knowledge. And it's quite intricate, <coughs> because for actual knowledge, it's knowledge that monies are traceable to a breach of trust or fiduciary duty as a possibility. If I contrast that with constructive knowledge, you have to have knowledge as a probability. So, at least theoretically speaking, there's quite a difference between the two. And as I've said, you've got three species of actual knowledge and two species of constructive knowledge. Now, just looking at one of the species of constructive knowledge, that is knowledge of circumstances which would put an honest and reasonable person on inquiry. But the question then arises, when is a person put on inquiry? And the answer to that seems to be um, when it seems a serious possibility that the money might be tainted. So you can see there's quite an intricate decision tree that you need to go through to work out whether there is the requisite knowledge or not. Yeah. So just a couple of points before I move on. The first is that I've already spoken about knowledge and notice. Now, strictly speaking, knowledge is the province of the personal claim, and notice is the province of the proprietary claim. But there's reasonably high authority that, in truth, there's no difference between them. And, and if we come back to our litigation solicitor, we can see that potentially they're under great jeopardy, because they know that the claimant company is asserting that the defender, that the director has effectively stolen the money. So on one view, that defendant solicitor can never take fees from a contested pot, because if they do, it will be suggested that they are doing so with the requisite knowledge. Now, the good news is that most of the time, the protection that the solicitor will have comes from the case of Carl Zeiss Stiftung and Herbert Smith because the view the court takes is that in fact the knowledge that the solicitor has is only that there is a claim, not that the claim is well founded. So essentially, so long as the solicitor has a genuine belief that the director defendant's claim is a plausible one, then they are not taken to have the requisite knowledge. But I, I can see some shaking of heads the, the problem is, of course, that the, that the solicitor can never be sure that they are doing the right thing. And there have been some interesting cases where the solicitor has actually gone to court to try to obtain a declaration in advance that they are entitled to take the money. And by and large, the courts refuse to do that. So the net result <coughs> is that the litigation solicitor potentially taking millions of pounds of defence costs doesn't ever know whether they're going to be able to justify having taken it or not. So, finally, and very briefly, remedies. I've already really discussed this with you. So, briefly, the personal claim is compensation. The proprietary claim is restitution in specie. My final point is that I've started to see claimants try to obtain, as it were, consequential damages so just to give you one example of one I've got at the moment, uh, which admittedly is a dishonest assistance claim, but I think it applies just as much to knowing receipt, is to suggest that you've taken the money. By taking the money, you allowed the director to carry on litigating. His decision to carry on litigating has caused me, the claimant, extra costs of my own, and I want to claim those costs from you. So it seems to me that that is a growing trend in claims of this type. Thank you, Jamie. Um, so uh, this all this assistance, um, we're starting, <coughs> starting with the, the, the core elements. Um, there are four of them on the, on the screen there, as you can see. Um, this. Um, first being the, the existence of the trust of which the payment is a beneficiary um, or uh, that the payment is only a fiduciary duty bad by the party. Secondly, a, a breach of that trust or fiduciary duty. Um, thirdly, uh, the defendant being assisted um, the third party in committing that breach. 
uh, and lastly, uh, the fact that that assistance was done uh, dishonestly. Now, a couple of, um, well, well t two, two points on this. Um, usually, the, the stage one and two questions are asked at the same time, so simply has there been a breach of, of trust? Um, but I think it is useful to keep them separate, particularly, uh, particularly when, um, when, when, when thinking about the claim of dishonest assistance, um, because I think it keeps one alive uh, to the, the possibility of um, what, what the, the broader situations in which dishonest assistance, the claim of dishonest assistance, can be brought, um, because then, then in, there need not uh, only be the dishonest for trust, it can also be a um, breach of a fiduciary duty. You can, um, therefore, get dishonest assistance claims um, arising where, where the duty from a, the fiduciary duty between a director and a company, for example, um, is breached, or, or fiduciary duties between partners um, in a joint venture, or the fiduciary duty owed by uh, an agent to a principal. So, I think it is useful to keep those um, uh, those stages separate when when thinking about it, at least um, in theory, and then. Um, a point about the breach of the underlying breach of trust <coughs> or breach of duty, um, that need not itself have been dishonest. So you can get the situation where the breach of trust is entirely innocent or, or, or honest, um, but actually the, it, the, the dishonesty uh, comes in um, only from, from the perspective of the first um, of, of the assistance to that breach of trust. And I'll, um, I'll come on to that in a bit more detail later as well. So, moving to the question of, well, what um, amounts to assistance for the purposes of a dishonest assistance claim? Um, there's, a, there's a nice pithy quote from Popwell J, um, as he then was, um, which I put on the screen there. Um, and I think what yeah, the, the takeaway from that really is that it's not a um, particularly prescriptive um, or, or, or limited test. Um, there's no requirement to, um, you know, there's, there's no but for requirement, um, for example, it's, it's simply that, that, it, that, the, that the conduct in Hainval needs to um, be shown to have in fact provided some um, form of assistance. Um, a, a related point as well is that, and again, this goes back to the, the, the point I, I just made. Um, is that the assistance, um, the, the, the breach of trust uh, can, as I've mentioned, um, itself be honest. So what might be more accurately thought of as procuring or inducing um, the breach of trust, not simply assisting the breach of trust, are all bound under the umbrella of um, assistance for the purposes of dishonest assistance. So the, 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 an example given in a case called Royal Brunei Airlines, um, where a, a solicitor can not only procure um, the, the, the trustees of the, of the trust to um, make, a, make an investment or, or a transaction which, which is unauthorised um, under the terms of the trust. So from the trustee's perspective, um, at, at the time the breach occurs, um, they are acting um, themselves in good faith um, and in accordance with what they think the terms of the trust um, mandate. It's only that um, the, the, the assister or the, the solicitors um, have, have, have been decided to vote at that point. Um, and I've also said that it's, it's, a, it's unusual to see a, um, a claim fail at the stage of the system. It's, um, I think that's, that's uh, what in my uh, it was more limited experience than Jamie's true, but Jamie confirms um, as well. Uh, and it is unusual to see them to be claimed fail at this stage. There is um, one. Uh, Case which I've seen cited as an example of where um, assistance wasn't uh, what well, the, the, the assistance complained about wasn't deemed to be um, sufficient, and that, that was called Brinks Limited and um, Abu Saleh. Um, now that, that was a, uh, an interesting case in the fact because the um, assistance was said to have been provided by Mrs. Elkham in helping her uh, husband drive uh, from uh, London or, or England to Zurich with a load of cash in their car. Um, so that they could go and deposit the cash at a Swiss bank and effectively launder money, um, which had been, uh, I think there had been a, a theft of, of, of bullion um, from a warehouse in, um, in Heathrow. So the dishonest fiduciary in that case was actually a security guard um, 
at the warehouse, and, and the assistance was in Mrs. Oldham's um, alleged assistance was in essentially providing cover um, for her husband uh, to be driving across the border um, and making these trips, basically so that the car didn't get searched because they had a lot of cash in the boot. Um, now, that, that, that claim against her failed um, because the judge held the um, assistance was not of a nature sufficient uh, to qualify for the purposes of deciding this assistance. Now, um, I, I don't think that will be decided the same way um, today. I think really what was being said there was that uh, because of what the uh, what Mrs. Adam didn't did and didn't know about what her um, husband was up to, I think she said she thought he was just doing some tax evasion, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and she and she wasn't aware um, that he was in fact. Um, Driving a lot of money over the years, was a business bank. So, so, a bit of a lesser of two evils. But uh, um, really, I think I think that the, 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 the correct analysis um, now would be uh, probably, uh, well, in my view at least, um, accompanying somebody on a on a uh, cross border car journey to, to give it the, an air of legitimacy. Probably, well, maybe enough. Uh, to constitute assistance for the purposes of corporate origins test. Um, so just, I mean, that's not the debate. I don't know too much about border security. Um, <laughs> uh, but, but, but really where that claim failed is that it, it, on a, given the finding of fat man in the case, um, Mrs. Elkham didn't seem to know enough uh, about what was really going on um, for it to be said that she was uh, uh, acting dishonestly. So, I, so I, I, I think rather than um, as I said, it is of a piece with the idea that um, usually I wouldn't expect a change now at the assistance stage, rather uh, at the more tricky, uh, potentially more difficult to prove this on a stage. Um, so moving, moving on to that, um, you will probably be familiar uh, with the, the modern test for um, dishonesty as set up by the Supreme Court in Ivy and Gensing. Um, there's a picture of, uh, of Phil Ivy, the post there, there smiling. Um, it irks me that he is smiling because I've, I've looked and he, his claim for how many million pounds it was failed in the High Court, the Court of Appeal and the Supreme Court. So the, that picture must be from the first day um, <laughs> of the morning of the first trial of the High Court because uh, I can't imagine why else he'd look so happy. Um, so um, briefly to, to re remind you of, of, uh, of, the, of the test from Ivan Genting, um, there are two limbs. Limb one is, is a subjective limb, uh, and, and the question is, what was the uh, defendant's actual state of mind uh, as to knowledge or belief about the facts at the relevant time? Um, and then after finding the fact made about what the defendant's actual state of mind was, you move on to the second limb, um, which is, uh, given uh, the findings that you've made at limb one, um, whether the defendant's conduct was honest um, by the standards of ordinary, decent people. Um, so those are, those are how the two limbs work together. There's a, um, a, a case uh, called Clydesdale Bank uh, and Workman, which, which uh, illustrates a number of these. Um, where it's, it's quite nice how those two limbs sit alongside each other. So um, there's a, a court of appeal case in 2016 um, where uh, the, the finding of the first instance judge um, that so this had acted dishonestly um, was overturned. And the, the reason why uh, was because the judge hadn't made full and proper findings um, at the limb one stage before moving on to the limb two question of whether the, the, the conduct of the solicitors was dishonest. Now, um, in a very condensed nutshell, um, one of the, one, one of the, what the real issue in the class of bank um, was about a sham charge over a property um, and um, what, what, what turned out to be a sham charge. And in, in reliance um, on that sham charge, the um, defendant solicitors um, who were, would be you know, accused of having dishonesty assisted the British Trust had, um, had paid away the proceeds of the sale of the property um, to a third party, the third party being um, the holder of this purported charge. Now, um, in in the, the evidence the solicitors gave at trial, um, they were very clear that subjectively 
they had believed that this charge um, was a bona fide um, charge and that uh, as such the third party that they paid the money away to um, was indeed entitled to that money. Um, so that, that, that was the evidence they gave um, the trial and um, the, the third sentence of judgment found that they had acted dishonestly um, and, 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 and considered the fact that they had, um, they had that the solicitor had carried out the instructions given to them um, by their client to pay out the money to a third party. What the trial judge didn't um, ask himself was, well, why did the um, defendant solicitors uh, uh, transfer the money to a third party? Um, this, uh, all, all other things being equal, there wouldn't have been um, any, any reason. This wasn't the case where the solicitors stood to make um, financial gain from carrying out the instructions. Um, and the judge had failed to um, make a finding of facts in the first instance of the judge didn't, um, about the um, about what about why they followed the instructions, but also about whether or how but also about how he treated the um, evidence that was had given at the, at the trial um, about their subjective belief. Um, so of, of course, the point here is it was perfectly within the judge's gift to. Um, to listen to what the solicitors uh, said about their subjective state of mind at the relevant time um, and dismiss that or find that that evidence um, wasn't, wasn't, wasn't truthful and, and to make a finding of fact that actually um, they hadn't believed that. Um, but it wasn't open for the trial judge um, to safely make a finding of dishonesty without addressing the evidence um, going to subjective belief which the solicitors um, had offered. So that, that was the first issue part of, of uh, Charles Dobbin. The, the, the second part was um, at the appeal hearing, perhaps when um, perhaps, perhaps when the uh, respondent realised the wind wasn't blowing in their favour, uh, an argument was raised that even if dishonesty wasn't enough, um, recklessness could, could still be sufficient for a finding of, um, in, the, in the context of the dishonest assistance claim. So, even if the solicitors weren't dishonest in um, how they paid the money away to the third party, they were reckless uh, in doing that because had they conducted any any reasonable, proper inquiries into um, into the status of the charge, for example, they would have realised what was going on. Um, and again, that was rejected. The court saying uh, quite clearly, and, and, and I think quite rightly, that recklessness and dishonesty are two separate things. Um, the finding of recklessness will, will often go hand in hand with the finding of dishonesty. Uh, and, you, and you can see how, you know, if you, you get a finding of negligence, um, perhaps recklessness, and then the red tip is um, the top of that mountain, you get to dishonesty. But I think they are um, distinct, uh, distinct concepts. Um, so the question I'll ask there is, well, does, re does recklessness have a, a role to play um, at all? And as I've said, the answer is um, no, in the sense that it's separate from dishonesty um, and they are separate concepts. But, but yes, um, in the sense of recklessness is itself um, quite good evidence of dishonesty. So the, the, the line between the two um, concepts can be quite thin. Um, and and, and as, I, as I've said, I read that so can often feed into dishonesty, but they are um, and should be kept separate. Um, so, the second element of uh, uh, of, 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 of uh, touch on this honesty is, is purely about this limb one question um, of well, how do I go about establishing um, a defendant's actual state of mind um, for the purposes of, of limb one? And here there are two concepts: um, actual knowledge and and blind eye knowledge. Now, for the purposes of limb one, um, the court of appeal. Uh, in the case of Group 7, um, held that it was correct in, in, in principle to elide the two concepts. So actual knowledge and blind eye knowledge are both treated as knowledge for the purposes of, of, of Lim 1. Um, but again, I think it is useful to keep these concepts um, distinct and separate because the requirements for, uh, for blind eye knowledge um, are separate and, and are quite stringent. So I've put the, uh, the test of blind eye knowledge there. Um, from the screen from a case called um, Manifest Shipping 
um, essentially a two-stage test. First, the natural suspicion that certain targeted facts may exist. Um, and secondly, a deliberate decision to refrain from taking steps to confirm their existence. Um, and I think it's worth emphasising that uh, it, it, it general suspicions uh, won't do for the purposes of, of blind knowledge of facts. Um, if, if blind knowledge is being um, alleged, I think uh, one needs to be very uh, specific about what exact facts um, are, are being... Now, well, firstly, what specific exact facts are being relied upon um, to establish uh, the, the knowledge uh, being alleged, and also what exactly that knowledge um, is. Uh, and uh, reading uh, the passage from Manifest Shipping uh, where this test was established, um, the Hazard, Hazard Laws case in North Scott was clear um, that to allow blind knowledge to be constituted by a decision not to require into an untargeted or speculative suspicion um, would be to allow negligence or be of gross to be the basis of the finding of privity. So um, I, I read that out because I think it is um, always important to remember um, and, and keep in mind when dealing with blind knowledge that it isn't a sort of um, a easy remedy to a situation where you know a, a defendant clearly knew that something fishy was going on, um, but you can't quite nail down actual knowledge. Um, it, it, it's, it, it's, it's still um, a, a concept with, with fairly um, stringent requirements. Um, the, the final point is uh, talking about suspicions. Well, if, if, if you can show that um, a defendant does have these general suspicions, but you can't um, satisfy those two requirements and manifest uh, shipping for the purpose of running knowledge, well, well, what, what next? Um, what, what, what is the, the role, the status of those, of those general suspicions? Um, so again, the question of ours as well, are the suspicions completely irrelevant? Um, and again, uh, yes, they are relevant in the sense that if you can't get over, if you can't satisfy that two limb test for manifest shipping, then for the purpose of blind knowledge, um, you are at a dead end. But um, again, again, this was a point arising out of Group Seven. Uh, if 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 uh, an individual does have general suspicions, that is still um, a relevant, uh, and, and that can be subjectively shown. Sorry. That is still relevant for the purposes of dishonesty, uh, the, the limb to assessment of dishonesty objectively. So you won't be able to prove with general suspicions um, particular facts um, by using by that knowledge, but you can still rely on the existence of those more generalised suspicions um, for the purposes of inviting the court to, to make a finding of dishonesty um, at stage two. So finally, um, some key, uh, what my, in my view, some, some key takeaways. Um, firstly, um, this on assistance is potentially um, quite a dynamic cause of action. Um, what do I really mean? Um, it, 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 it's not confined um, to what you might think of the parallel example of the um, solicitor receiving trust money and then paying them out to a third party. That's, that's often uh, the, the, the textbook case which comes up with the example given, but it can be of a, a broader application than that. Um, secondly, uh, as I've just touched on, um, blind eye knowledge is a, it, it is a difficult um, concept to successfully invoke in that you still need to show um, actual knowledge um, of particular facts, albeit those facts will be more upstream than the ultimate fact that you're trying to establish by blind eye blind knowledge. Um, there is still uh, a requirement of, of, uh, of targeting and, 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 and proving knowledge of, of, of certain facts in order to get over the blind knowledge um, hurdles. Um, and then, thirdly and, and finally, um, this, is a, this, this, is, this is really a general point about um, dishonesty. But one of the, the themes that, that seems to me to, to arise out of um, reading out of cases where dishonesty is alleged against professionals um, is that, is that well, well, firstly, I'm sure we'll all be pleased to know it, it, it's not straightforward. It, it, it is quite hard um, 
to, to convince the court, absent a clear financial motive for the individual um, who's been shown to, who's being alleged to have been dishonest. Um, it, 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 it's, it's not an easy thing to convince the court that, um, that they have acted dishonestly, and, and at the very end of, of the handout, um, there are a number of uh, uh, the authorities which um, speak on this general point that uh, fraud and dishonesty are inherently improbable, um, especially when carry, allegedly carried out by professionals, unless you can show, um, for example, a okay, clear financial motive um, for the alleged dishonesty. And, 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 and I think that's one of the key things to always keep in mind when um, <coughs> considering bringing these claims or, or looking at defending them. Um, it, it's motive, it's, it's the why question, which can often be, um, when, when putting these games together, um, overlooked or not paid proper attention. Um, again, we, we saw it in the, in the Clivesbank case. If it, it, was, it was the Court of Appeal asking themselves the why question. Um, why did the solicitors do this? Um, was there any reason for them to do it? Um, in the absence of a, um, of, of, a, of a motive or a reason why, um, was it really dishonest? Um, and there's also, um, and, and, and that theme has really been echoed in recent cases. Um, and again, some of those at the, at the end of the handout. But I think that's one of the, one of the key um, questions on, on the facts, really, um, when we step into our roles as, as amateur detectives um, in these sorts of claims, is asking asking why um, whoever is being an entrepreneur and sort of, um, would have, would have done um, uh, what, what was that should have been doing. Um, so I think that brings me to the end. Um, any questions? Well, it's obviously articulated this. So. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure about that. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you.